Today is Palm Sunday. It is the Sunday that precedes Easter, and it marks the beginning of what is known as Holy Week. Over the next seven days, Christians from around the world will reflect upon things like the triumphal entry, the Last Supper, the betrayal of Christ, the crucifixion, all leading up to the resurrection, which will be celebrated on Easter Sunday one week from today. On, on, on this day, Palm Sunday, we, we often think of Jesus riding on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem for a final time as, as the people lay palm branches on the road shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And although I have preached that exact text every Palm Sunday for the last nine years straight, I was struck by something new this week. See, not, not only is it Palm Sunday today, but for those of you who are maybe in tune with the historicity of scripture and some of what is happening also around the world, you would also recognize that today is the Feast of Purim which commemorates an event from the Bible 2,500 years ago when a woman named Esther and a man named Mordecai appealed to a God that they knew as Yahweh. And when all hope seemed lost and when the enemy looked like he had won and when darkness appeared like it had prevailed, this God intervened. And now, two millennia later, people still celebrate that our God overcomes every obstacle, our God tears down every idol, and our God still has the power to save. And I want to tell you the story of the Feast of Purim today, because I think in many ways it paints with great prophetic brilliance the moment that we find ourselves in as a people and as a region in the year of our Lord, 2024. And this story, of course, comes from the book of Esther, and starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, this is her story. The Bible says this, this is what happened during the time of Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. <laughs> Let me transport you back in time. 500 years before the birth of Christ. The Persian Empire has, has taken over as the world's lone superpower. They, they, they quickly become the largest and best organized civilization in the ancient world. The empire is home to 50 million people, which, which might not sound like a lot to you, but at the time that this story was written, it was half of the world's entire population in the 5th century B.C., it included over 2,500 miles of road, which served to connect Persia's major trade routes, and it allowed the Persians to create the world's first ever postal service, which probably ran better than ours does today. <laughs> but as Persia grew in prominence, God's people suffered in anguish. See, friend, the, the nation of Israel no longer existed. The temple in Jerusalem was nothing more than a smoldering ember on the ash heap of history. And without a homeland to call their own, the, the Jewish people find themselves living in a strange land governed by a foreign empire, wondering if God would ever bring them back home. Watch as the story continues. In the third year of his reign, Xerxes held a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. <laughs> and for a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the glory of his majesty. And when these days were over, the king held another banquet lasting seven days. Get this. For 180 days, the emperor of the Persian Empire, a man by the name of Xerxes, has been throwing the world's most outrageous party. For six months straight, this man has partied just to show off his insane wealth, his splendor, and his power. <laughs> and Xerxes reaches the end of this six-month rager, and he decides, I got another seven days of partying left in me. <laughs> 
like in the days of Xerxes, we live in a world that has overdosed on opulence. In the 1980s, William Strauss, a a lawyer from Harvard, and Neil Howitt, a history major from Yale, developed a theory on, on how historical events repeat in accordance with generational cycles. In their book, The, the Fourth Turning, Strauss and Howe described the history of spiritual awakenings over the last 250 years of American history. They proved through academic research that great spiritual revivals happen when societies and people groups have achieved all the success and luxuries that life can afford only to find themselves more empty than they've ever been before. Oh friend, make no mistake, this is the world we live in today. Incredible wealth, incredible technology, incredible influence, and yet people have climbed the ladder of success only to find their souls plagued with incredible anxiety, incredible loneliness, and incredible pain. People have gained the world yet lost their own souls and yet I still believe that there is an awakening on the horizon that will cause people to look beyond the temporary pleasures of this place and turn their affections back to God. (laughs) Now watch, watch. Now, Now on the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, that means drunk, (laughs) he commanded his servants to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown. (laughs) The the rabbinical literature surrounding Esther 1 says that what King Xerxes was requesting was for Queen Vashti to wear her crown and only her crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. (laughs) Then the king became furious and he burned with anger. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, the king asked. If it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree which cannot be repealed that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes and let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. (laughs) Xerxes wants to parade his wife in front of his friends, but she has no interest in being eye candy for the king. She refuses his request to appear at his party, and in response, he issues an edict. Vashti will never again enter the presence of the king. Now hear me, friend. I know it seems chaotic, but there is blessing in the breakup, because God has something better behind the scenes. See, many of you are familiar with this story. The woman for who this book is named after, Esther, will eventually become the wife of King Xerxes, and God will use her in sovereign ways to save and preserve God's people. But you ought to trust God today that in the midst of what seems broken, God is working things together for your good. That relationship that fell through, that job that didn't line up, that deal that didn't materialize, oh, it was difficult when it happened. It hurt the way that it went down, but God was setting you up for something greater and better than you could ever imagine. And God used the backdrop of a breakup to reinvigorate a people who had almost forgotten what it meant to be chosen by God. Now get this, it's interesting. The name Vashti means I am beautiful, but the name Esther means I am hidden. See, I I don't know about you, but, but the older I get, the more grateful I become that my life is judged by God's value system, not man's. <laughs> For the world and its desires are passing away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Hear me, friends, you haven't been forgotten, you've been hidden. You haven't been overlooked. You've been hidden. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. He crowns the humble with victory. And he is preserving you for the task that lays ahead. Now watch, the story continues. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Now this advice, of course, was very appealing to the king. So he put the plan into effect. (laughs) 
Uh, I want you to see this today, friend. The, the plan of God is at work and the king don't even know it. He thinks it's his idea to host a beauty pageant. He thinks it's his idea to dump Vashti and look for someone new. But God has been the one pulling the strings this entire time because the heart of the king is like water in the hand of the Lord. He moves it in whatever direction he wishes. See, Xerxes is searching for love. But God is searching for Xerxes. 250 years before Xerxes ever sits on the throne, a man named Isaiah prophesies that God will raise up a superpower called the Persian Empire and the Lord will use them to re-inherit God's remnant people. Psalms 2 says God sits on his throne and laughs when the nations rage and plot vain things. I've got good news. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans control the future for the church in America. God has us right where he wants us and he will not stop until his people encounter him again. <laughs> now at that time, at that time, there was a, a Jewish man in the city of Susa whose name was Mordecai. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a descendant of, of Kish. This man had a, had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. <laughs> The history associated with the life of, of Esther says that Esther's father died while mom was pregnant. And Esther's mom died during childbirth. Meaning this, from the earliest days of Esther's life, Mordecai became her adopted father and he loved her like his own. And I love what the scriptures say here in verse 5. It, it almost feels like a coincidental, ancillary piece of text. And at this time, there, there was a Jewish man in the city named Mordecai. It just so happened that when the kingdom was shaken and the queen was getting booted out of her royal kingdom, that there was a Jewish man in the city named Mordecai. It just so happened when Esther was orphaned as a baby with no one to take care of her, there was a, a Jewish man in the city named Mordecai. It just so happened when people had forgotten about a temple that used to shine with God's glory glory and a homeland that they could call their own and a holy city named Jerusalem that hold the relics and the artifacts of a time when God intervened on behalf of his people. It just so happened that there was still a, a Jewish man in the city named Mordecai. I, I would venture to say today, God has already planted provision in the fields that lay ahead of you that you're not even aware of. God's got more people in this city than we do. He's got more provision than we first considered. The God who was faithful before is gonna be faithful again. And what I found is if I just be faithful to allow him to be the light and the lamp upon my path, all of a sudden hidden provision will become revealed provision if I'll just be faithful to follow in the way that he has asked me to go. And what I love about Mordecai is he demonstrates in the book of Esther what it really means to be a father. He, he, he wasn't even the one who contributed his DNA that resulted in the birth of this baby girl. But when crisis hits and mom and dad are gone, Mordecai steps up and in doing so demonstrates what God by his spirit has done on our behalf as well. And that's why the New Testament declares you are not orphans, but you have received the spirit of adoption by which you cry out, Abba, Father. It's why David could say, when my mother and my father abandoned me, God took me in. It's why the Bible can say he shares his house with the widow 
and his table with the orphan. It's why Jesus can tell the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send my spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, and he will be with you. And what Mordecai demonstrates in Esther 2 is what God has demonstrated from the very beginning of time, that from the very moment you were born, he placed his seal and his love and his favor upon your life and been waiting for the day until you recognize him as who he really is. Now watch, as a result of the king's decrees, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the city of Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. But Esther did not reveal her nationality or family background. Why? Because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And as a result, she obtained, watch, grace and favor. So he set a royal crown on her head and he made her queen instead of Vashti. See, Esther cannot reveal her nationality because to be a Jew in the Persian empire was to live life as a second class citizen. Mordecai senses that there is something strategic about Esther's promotion in the season that lays ahead for her. And he gives her advice that ultimately functions as prudent wisdom for that which awaits her. See, friend, I'm convinced that you need Mordecai's in your life who see your potential but yet can help speak to and advise your practical. You know, at this church, we have a team of five elders that attend here. They live in the area. They're local. And those five elders, they they oversee our finances, our theology, and me. (laughs) They function as Mordecai's who see pursuits potential and advise on the practical. Because the saddest thing in the world is potential that goes unrealized because of practical stuff that goes undealt with. See, in our world today, people surround themselves with fans instead of fathers, personalities instead of prophets. Yet the scriptures say there is wisdom as counsel, victory is won through many advisors, and he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Now watch, you might have an Esther anointing, but if you don't got some Mordecai perspective, your potential will only ever be that potential. And notice the pattern. Xerxes was attracted to Esther, but what ultimately causes Esther to inherit the crown was grace and favor that came from God. You got to hear me today. God will use your natural as an avenue to showcase your spiritual. Your business acumen is a natural avenue to showcase a spiritual reality. Your intellect is a natural avenue to showcase a spiritual reality. Your skill set, your talent, your aptitude. In Esther 2, it was her beauty that was a natural avenue to showcase a spiritual reality. For the scriptures say a man's gift makes room for him. Now you gotta see this. It was Esther's beauty that opened the door. But it was grace and favor that caused her to wear the crown. Can I tell you what is on the outside of your life, which is what other people see, might be enough to open the door that is waiting in front of you. But there's a lot of people who walk through a lot of open doors, but they don't have the character or the integrity or their perspective or the endurance to build a life on the other side of that which they've walked through. So instead of being able to build something that stands the test of time, they flirt with destiny only to get caught up in self-sabotage and then return to the bondage of their previous season. It was the beauty of Esther that opened the door, but it was the grace and favor that dwelt inside of her that caused Xerxes to put a crown on her head that gave her a position of prominence in the kingdom and that would ultimately be used as a leverage point for her voice to save God's people. 
Your beauty might get you there, but your grace and favor will keep you there. Your skill set may get you there, but your grace and your favor will keep you there. And we need both and, not either or, in our world today. Now watch, the story continues. So King Xerxes promoted Haman to the highest position in his kingdom. But Haman was a descendant of Agag. Get this. And all the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect when he passed by. But Mordecai refused to bow down or pay him honor. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. You got to get this because you wouldn't see this in a casual reading of the scripture, but you got to get this. The Bible says Haman was a descendant of who? Agag. And who was Agag? The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 15, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And in 1 Samuel, Saul was instructed by the Lord to wipe out the Amalekites. But he did not do the job completely and he let Agag live. Hear me, Haman is the descendant of Saul's mistake. Yet if you'll remember the verse that we just read a few moments ago, what does it say of Mordecai? He was a descendant of Kish. And who was Kish? Kish was the father of Saul. So in Esther 3, the descendant of Saul, who was Mordecai, faces off with the descendant of Agag the Amalekite, a man named Haman. And Mordecai has been keeping score. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Any battle that you refuse to fight in your generation doesn't just simply disappear by the time that you have kids. It grows and it morphs and it transforms into an even bigger giant that one day will tell your children's children to bow down before them. That porn addiction doesn't disappear when you die. If you don't defeat it, it gets passed down. That alcohol addiction does not disappear when you die. If you don't defeat it, it gets passed down. But in the same way that generational bondage can get passed down, so can generational freedom. Which means this, if you'll get free in 2024, it'll have a cascading effect on a generation that you don't see. But I promise you, we'll feel the impacts of a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa who was willing to conquer their demons so their kids didn't have to. So during the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence. Those lots were called Purim to determine the best day and month to take action. Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain race of people scattered through the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different. They refuse to obey the laws of the king. And if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. So on the 13th day of the first month, a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. I love this. Number one, 2,500 years later, the Jews are still celebrating the feast of Purim. (laughs) They took the exact tool that the enemy had used as a setup to try to decide their untimely fate. And they hijacked it and turned it in to a week of celebration. (laughs) I thought that's what God's people do. We colonize what the enemy meant for evil and we use it for good. (laughs) Even the stripes and the scars that are on, on, on the back of Jesus that Isaiah prophesies about when he talks about the Messiah being a suffering servant have now become the greatest testament to our healing and our forgiveness. Even today, the most common piece of jewelry in the West is a cross worn around somebody's neck or tattooed on somebody's body. We took the symbol of pain and agony and abuse and degradation and we hijacked it and used it as our own. Why? Because the cross is foolishness to him who is perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'm not sure about you, but I think Haman's critique of the Jewish people is actually the greatest compliment we could ever receive. 
There is a certain race of people scattered across the Pacific Northwest. Their customs are different. Their lives are consecrated. Their allegiance isn't to the king. Their fidelity to Christ is so distinct that they have become a threat to our established order. <laughs> May that be the crowning testimony of pursuit people, that everywhere we go, we become a disruptive force to the normal operational order of the culture around us. And watch what it says, watch what it says. A decree gets issued when? On the 13th day of the first month. That means a letter was sent out to all 127 provinces on the 13th day of the first month. But do you know what happens in the Jewish calendar on the 14th day of the first month? A little celebration called Passover begins. Imagine being a part of a Jewish family in the Persian kingdom gathered around your dinner table celebrating a Seder meal together. You're going around the table and you're retelling the story of the Exodus how God performed 10 signs and wonders against Pharaoh. How God split the Red Sea and swallowed up the Egyptian army. How God rained manna down from heaven when Moses took the staff and split the rock and water came out. How they were led by a fire and a cloud. How the smoke of the Lord rested over the tabernacle. How God opened up the ground and swallowed up their enemies. Imagine sitting around for your Seder meal on the 14th day of the first month when the Passover celebration begins and all of a sudden, you get a knock on your door. Yeah, what is it? We're in the middle of a party. I got a letter from the king. Says you all are going to be destroyed. And I imagine mom or dad taking that letter, throwing it on the table and thinking to themselves, man, the timing of God is sure funny. You're edict of death seeks to interrupt our celebration of life but the same God who defeated the death decree of Pharaoh will defeat the death decree of Haman for our God is faithful to a thousand generations now watch, watch, watch when Mordecai learned of all that had been done he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly And Esther summoned her her attendant, Hathak, and he ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Mordecai told him the story. Mordecai gave him a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hathak to show it to Esther and direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for the people. Then Esther sent back this message to Mordecai. All the king's servants and people know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been invited is doomed to die. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? Who knows, Esther? Maybe, just maybe, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Mordecai, as a prophetic voice of wisdom, possesses Esther with a question that will not let her sleep nor slumber until she has an answer. Maybe, just maybe, you were called to this kingdom, this season, this region, this church, this family, this community, this generation for such a time as this. And I love it. I love it. I love the response from Mordecai. Esther, even if you decide not to use your voice, the God I serve, he will cause relief and deliverance to come up from another source on behalf of his people. But watch, you're going to miss out 
on being able to play a part in this story. Hear me, friend. I feel like I hear that instruction from the Lord today. Russ, even if you decide not to give, even if you decide not to serve, even if you decide not to pray, not to preach, not to lead, I'll cause resource and provision to come from somewhere else, but you're going to miss out on being able to play a part in this story. And to be honest, I'm in this for the stories. I'm in this for the stories of salvation and miracles in Snohomish. I'm in this for the stories of radical life change in Kirkland. I'm in this for a generation of college students at UW to encounter the power and the glory of King Jesus. I don't need to be the hero, but I refuse to not play my part. I'm going to swing for the fences. I'm going to dream big. I'm going to hope against hope because I'd rather fail at attempting something great than deal with the pain of missing an opportunity to play my part. Let me end here. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews and fast for me. Huh. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast like, likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. <laughs> Can I tell you, friend, I still believe in the power of fasting and prayer. <laughs> I, I, I still believe in the power of a people who will knock on the door of heaven until there is an answer that is delivered on their behalf. And I love how Esther returns to her roots in this moment. It's almost like the juxtaposition of this narrative as it plays out in the book that bears her name. It's going from a woman who never had a biological mom or dad that she knew, raised by an uncle who operated in great charity and hospitality and took her as his own. A gal who could never be honest about her nationality or her ethnicity, lest she be canceled or killed by the culture she was being raised in. In. And finally, in this moment, it has come to a head. She is now understanding the reason for why she was born, the moment that she had been created for, even while God was forming her in the mother's womb of a mom that she would never even get to meet. And all of a sudden, now Esther's getting courage and she's getting boldness and she's getting fired up. And she says, You know what? I'm tired of hiding. I'm tired of being in the shadows. I'm tired of pretending that I am something I am not. I'm going to go to the king, which is against the law. I'm going to tell him I'm a Jew, which is against the culture. But I will be a voice that speaks to the salvific reality of God's remnant people. And if I perish, I perish but I'm gonna play my part. Let me end here, friend. You don't get the joy of Easter without first walking through the trials of Esther. You don't get the power of resurrection without first embracing the fellowship of suffering. You don't get miracles without risk. You don't get breakthrough without faith. I can't promise you that this is going to be easy, but I am more convinced than I have ever been before. We have been called to this kingdom and this region for such a time as this, and I'm not missing my opportunity to play my part. And I just feel like today that, that maybe, just maybe, that would be the, the Holy Spirit's invitation for us. It's one thing to attend. It's another thing to, to play your part. <laughs> it, it's one thing to show up. It's, it's another thing to give and serve and meet a friend and ingratiate yourself to the community and build houses and plant vineyards and be trained up in the way that you should go. That, that you would never depart from it. 
oh, 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 we, we, we live during a season not too unlike what Esther experienced in the Persian kingdom. Overdosed on opulence, yet bankrupt in our souls. Hoping that what the world can offer can scratch the spiritual itch that torments the culture around us. And yet because of the power of what Christ Jesus has done on our behalf, he has given us keys to this kingdom. And now our job is to play our part. And whatever the cost may be and however crazy or wild the road may get in front of us, it is well worth it for the story of redemption that will come from a community of Esthers and Mordecais who answer the question, maybe, just maybe, you were born for such a time as this. Come on, would you stand as we close today?